Now, Turkish officials say they do know the identity of the man who gunned down dozens of people in a nightclub on New Year's Eve, but he's still on the run. Since war broke out in Syria nearly six years ago, a wave of youngsters have been radicalized in the name of ISIS. Omar Saif Obash is extremely worried by all of this. He is the United Arab Emirates ambassador to Russia. He's actually half Russian, half Arab himself, and he knows the effect of violence firsthand because his own father was assassinated in the 1970s. Obash has just penned a new book. It's a series of letters to his son called Letters to a Young Muslim. He writes, quote, perhaps by looking at why we still cherish the model of the warrior, we might begin to understand where we have fallen behind the rest of the world. Ambassador Kobash joins me now from New York to discuss. Welcome to the program. You really are putting forth a public and original departure from what a lot of, I don't know, the trend in this sort of reflection of what's going on has been. Why did you decide to do this at this point, Ambassador? Well, to be honest, it's been on my mind uh, ever since September 11th. Um, prior to September 11th, uh, my friends and I had always been aware of uh, the power of uh, the uh, fundamentalist or uh, extremist narrative. Uh, we never really thought that it would uh, move to towards action. Um, with September 11th, I mean, for, for me personally, this was a, 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 a terrible uh, tragedy. Uh, and it made me think that um, people who disagree with that approach, disagree with the approach of violence uh, to achieving um, political or, or uh, religious aims, have to really think about where we've gone wrong. And so I spent a number of years really uh, quite puzzled by uh, all of all of the um, uh, the, the responses of the Muslim right. world uh, to uh, to the events of September 11. So I, I, I figured that we, we should be looking at the reality of Islam as opposed to worrying about the image of Islam in the West. Well, you do, right, and you're, you're also obviously concerned about how you de-radicalize some of these who have been radicalized. And in one of the quotes in these letters to your son, you talk about Muslim individuality. Let me just quote. You say to your son, Saif, I really believe that the idea of the Muslim individual is the simplest and most effective unit for the regeneration of the Muslim world. There's no need for us to build bombs and regiments and religious cults that promise a return to a glorious past in order to build a glorious future. So many people might agree with you, except for all those people who are going out there, because they believe in this notion of a caliphate and this glorious nostalgia of a past that they're trying to recapture for themselves. Well, I, I think one of the problems here is that um, uh, traditionally we, uh, the way we look at uh, our Islamic history is in, a term, in terms of a series of dates, uh, warriors, and, and battles fought and, and won, and in some cases lost. And I think that we really need to think historically that there were so many other things going on. Uh, there were people living lives, there were people uh, trading, uh, there were people studying and, and, and developing sort of centers of knowledge. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, it's been repeated many times that uh, Islam isn't simply a, a, a there, there were the golden period of Islam, and I really think that we need to think about how we can um, re-express uh, these new, the, these interesting areas uh, in our Islamic life. Uh, I think that to, to, to say that all of Islam was just a, a history of battles and warriors uh, is to reflect an ignorance of, of our own uh, faith. So as you continue to pursue that, and as you say, for instance, you know, one of the questions you posed in your letters is about any number of attacks recently. I mean, we've seen Turkey, we've seen all over the place. You particularly talk about the ones in Europe. You say I think we need to look at Charlie Hebdo and the Bataclan and Orlando and ask ourselves if this is not precisely what some of us are taught by our religious leaders. Is there not some truth to the idea that a strain of Islam welcomes repenters and born-again Muslims and asks of them to clear their sins by acts of great piety or fanaticism? So again, if you were in charge, how would you, you know, combat that very troublesome issue. I th well, firstly, it's, a, it's going to take a long-term approach, and it's going to require a political will, and it will require a, um, a, a certain a dedication from uh, people like myself and others. Uh, we really need to look at what we're saying to each other and the consequences of those, uh, of those conversations and, and debates. Uh, it is one thing for us to divide the world between friend and foe, uh, Muslim and, and non-believer. Yeah, if, if we're sitting in uh, 7th century Arabia or even 10th century uh, Baghdad or, or, or Damascus, it's 
very different uh, thing to divide between friend and foe when we are living in multicultural societies. Uh, and I think that this is where we need to be more, uh, more interesting in the way we analyze uh, our relationship with others. Um, Okay. We need to also think, I, no, I'd, I'd like to also add just a, a very simple point, that we always look back to the 7th century as a, a period of moral perfection. And, and uh, in, in a certain sense, that's precisely what it was. But we also need to think in terms of moral progress, that the, the 7th century uh, uh, and, and the time of the prophet was a time of moral perfection within that community. We can now look at new challenges and new moral situations to, to develop a sense of moral progress towards um, moral perfection in our own uh, time. Let me just ask you some more contemporary issues because as, as ambassador to Russia, you know the situation there very well. You've got Russia involved in Syria. Give me a sense of being a Muslim ambassador in Russia, knowing that the country has a historic fear of, you know, the invasion of the hordes. I want to know from your perspective why you think Putin's agenda has been the one it is in Syria, for instance. Uh, well, I, I've been in Russia for eight years, so I, I, I may have uh, a slightly uh, uh, tainted or biased view. Um, I, uh, my understanding is uh, essentially that uh, Russia has a serious fear of uh, radical Islam. Uh, the uh, festering situation in Syria for the first four years of the, of the civil war um, uh, uh, led to Russia feeling that it had to intervene in some way. Um, I can tell you that from my eight years in Russia, there certainly is a great worry uh, about radical Islam. Uh, and uh, there is a, a serious threat. Uh, 18 to 20 percent of the Russian population is uh, Sunni Muslim. Um, many of them have been radicals. Um, many of them have uh, spent time uh, in Syria fighting uh, in, in, a, in a jihad. Yeah. Uh, and many of them are saying that they're going to come back. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the situation for Russia is uh, in Syria is not simply uh, in the traditional idea of, of supporting a, uh, an, an ally in the region. Um, I, I take the uh, argument of uh, as radical Islam much more seriously from the Russian perspective. I see. Let me move on to the Middle East peace process. As you know, there's been a lot of sort of diplomacy by tweet going on right now. But the key core issue that the Palestinians have taken issue with is if the Trump administration actually moves the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, they say they will have to revoke their recognition of Israel and that other Arab nations, such as your own, will have to follow suit. Tell me what you think will be the fallout in the Arab and Muslim world of the U.S. moving its embassy now to Jerusalem. Well, I, I'll speak uh, as an Arab and a Muslim, uh, rather than in, in any official capacity. Uh, the idea of moving the uh, U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, uh, in my pos um, position, I think would uh, simply uh, cause an earthquake uh, right across the region, both the Arab world and the Islamic world. And, you know, well, one, one would just uh, simply question why would it be so important at this stage to preempt any uh, further understanding between uh, the Palestinians and, and the Israelis, uh, given that, you know, the Jerusalem has importance uh, a symbolic importance for the Muslim world as well. Um, so it, it, to me, it, it doesn't really make sense, and one would hope that it's, uh, it's a certain amount of posturing at All this right. stage. Okay, good to get your view on that and the rest of your important tracts. Thank you very much, Ambassador Robash.